We're with the armed forces sweeping through northern Syria. We get a chilling glimpse inside the IS war machine and see the tunnels they're building for escape. We find some of the archaeological treasures funding the militant activities and talk to the Yazidi women used as sex slaves. And we hear why this is a war drawing in people from across the world. So you left your children? Yeah, I left my children. You saw how Britain and other Western countries weren't doing anything about it whatsoever. I felt compelled to come over and help out. Finally, the armed groups making up the Syrian Democratic Forces have reason to celebrate. They've enjoyed a string of military successes recently. Now they're poised to move on Raqqa, the headquarters of IS in Syria. If they retake that, the extremists known here as Daesh are all but finished in Syria. There are a lot of Daesh militants there. Because of this, Daesh will try to protect this city. They have already resisted in many places, like al Shaddadi, but they will resist even more in Raqqa. If Raqqa falls, Daesh will be reduced to just 20% of their territory. They will lose 80% of what they have been controlling. We've been given rare access to the inner circle of the democratic forces, traveling with them day and night as they advance through northern Syria. It's remote and tough terrain, burning hot during the day, bitingly cold at night. This is an army on the move, bit by bit, claiming territory, pushing out IS fighters or Daesh, but also clearing the area of the Syrian regime too. A bulldozer travels with the troops, constantly building defensive barriers out of the sand. As the troops split up into small groups and leapfrog forward. There is some resistance. They're basically trying to smoke out the IS uh, fugitives who are in front. They're having trouble though. Uh, they've fired several mortars, heavy machine gun fire, still not shifting them. This army is made up of Arabs, Christians, but mainly Kurds from the male and female military wings, the YPG and YPJ. The women are renowned for their fighting prowess. They're often in the forefront of the battles because of the IS taboo that to be killed by a female will mean they won't go to heaven. I'm not a together. We inside the YPJ are fighting a moral fight. The courage that we get, we get it from our comradeship. Our courage, our strength, our beliefs, we draw this all from our comradeship. It's a life which is not just about war. It affected me hearing about the massacre happening against the Yazidi women. And as a woman, I felt I had a duty to help. I live with the pictures of our dead comrades. I put these pictures here myself, and I look at them and I wonder, how can we follow their footsteps? How can we follow their example? Their photos remind me of these things. You know, we never want them to be forgotten. And it's not just Kurdish female fighters being lured to the front line. Destina left her home and four young children in Poland to fight here. 
How long have you been here for? Six months now. And you've not seen your children or your anyone else from your family in the meantime? Well, I did uh, a couple of times on the internet. I think the last time was one month ago or something. Yeah, it is hard. How do you feel being away from them? Oh, it's awful. It's awful. Uh, she knows every day I'm like, okay, I, I think I have to go home now because I have to see my children. It's like, yeah, I miss them. How do you manage to do it? How do you get yourself to go on? Well, I try not to think about it. I, I, I'm like, okay, I will do what I have to do here and I will see them when I go home. Her closest friend now is a 19-year-old from Canada. Oh, no, she's just my best friend. We almost died together. Yeah, we almost died together. Everyone treats you equal here. They fight, they die, they bleed beside you, and they would do anything to protect you. You don't know these people, but they would take a bullet for you. And I've seen people try and be injured trying to save somebody else. How much of a big decision was it for you? How, how did your family react, your parents? Oh, my parents, they weren't uh, too pleased with the decision, but my always supportive of me. And, uh, of course, they had their, don't go, you don't know what's going to happen, but uh, I had to, you know. Have there been moments when you regretted it, when you doubted y your decision? No. There have been moments where it's sol like solidified my decision to come here. But the troops are reliant on old equipment. And whilst we witnessed incredible motivation to succeed, they're up against a determined enemy. This is what it looks like from the other end. IS footage shows an organized military force and their propaganda videos typically depict their suicide bombers as heroes. Suicide vehicles are being used more and more by the terror group. But they also have superior weapons, newer and more powerful. The democratic forces are being helped now by coalition airstrikes, bombing IS targets ahead of the troops moving in on the ground. They are making some headway. Those suspected of being IS militants are arrested. And we saw many of the menfolk in the villages rounded up for questioning. Often the troops just swept straight into communities once held by the extremists, only to find the fighters already gone. Even so, progress is painfully slow, much to the frustration of the volunteers, keen to be involved in war action, despite most having zero military experience. How have you found it here? Oh, it's uh, definitely initially culture shock, mm -hmm. but uh, the Kurds are awesome, and there are a lot of Westerners, a lot of familiarity there. Uh, great guys, you know, it, it's tough living, not to mention on top of that you're in a war zone. You must have seen some pretty awful things, I imagine. How have you managed to cope with that? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know, after a while you get a little desensitized to it. Uh, you see things that might shock you at first, and then after a while it just becomes normal. And Such as? Like seeing uh, people you know wounded, people you know killed. Uh, if you have to pick up enough dead bodies, enough wounded, 
eventually uh, seeing that type of stuff doesn't affect you as much. I didn't want to be just one of those people on Facebook complaining endlessly about all this horrible stuff Dash is doing. I figured I could come here. It's easy enough, so I did. Many are just disgusted with the West's inaction. Britain and other Western countries weren't doing anything about it whatsoever. And they were just letting it go on and decided I wanted to come out here and get involved in it myself. How involved have you been, do you think? I don't really know how much more involved you can be. Um, I mean, there's not so much fighting anymore, but last time I was out here we fought quite a lot. Got shot before in the arm. Um, I mean, now they get a lot more help from Western countries. I just saw some of the, the, the things um, that were happening, along with what with ISIS, some of the atrocities they were they were committing, um, and I thought, what with the military background, I might be able to do do something to help. <laughs> the foot soldiers of the democratic forces survive on meager rations for weeks on end. They sleep rough in the open. What is happening? Go, go. Marching through the night with little or no night vision. Digging yeah. foxholes as much for shelter as for defense. And they know to let up and drop their guard carries enormous risks. It's not surprised they are uh, fighting. Yes, not surprised they are every time uh, fighting and attack every day. For, for this uh, they can use every gun and they use in, in Shadat we find uh, we found many uh, many military uh, things material and uh, uh, ammunition and guns many things they use everything and they are strong and the fight is nowhere near over yet in part 2 we see the bombs left behind by IS as a strategic town is liberated. And the building where hundreds of women were abused, known as the Rape House. Wrestling Al Shaddadi town from the clutches of IS has been one of the most significant victories for the democratic forces so far in Syria. It's a ghost town now. The IS stamp is still on every shop, a way the terror group had of organizing its extortion racket. Everywhere are the results of coalition airstrikes. This is what's left of the IS police station, where people were tortured for crimes such as smoking. Movement. A makeshift gallows is still outside, welded to an electricity pylon. They killed them on the ground, and then they hanging him to all people see him. Yes. In row upon row of houses, we found the remnants of daily lives. IS fighters' lives. Homes left in a hurry, belongings scattered, and evidence of how their activities were regulated and documented by the extremists. Okay, there's a wealth of information in this house. Uh, one about what and how the women should dress, showing that they have to be completely covered. And we know that there were lots of um, IS police which went around administering that. This is the Daesh fighters, the IS fighters' salary slip. He was paid $125 a month. He had to write 
military reports on all the places where he'd battled, and these come from Anbar province, from Hasaka here in northern Syria, and from Raqqa. He was obviously learning Arabic. This is part of his Arabic lessons. And a lot of personal information about him himself, I'll just turn it round, uh, showing that he had eight wives, that he'd bought one woman as a sex slave, and she had four children. It even gives detail about his blood type and his shoe size. In the backyards of many of the homes, they built bunkers for their families to use in the event of an attack. It's another, another bunker. This one looks a bit more substantial. Mm. Oh, and it's even got a bed. A little, a little bed so that they can actually stay here and bunker down and basically live here for a bit. This was hidden behind locked doors and closed curtains. Whoever was building it didn't want it to be common knowledge. There was an air supply as well as electricity. It was probably an escape route for the terror group's elite. From the huge big shaft, then right round here and through, this was an incredible elaborate system and they were planning to basically tunnel their way out of here if needs be. There are unexploded booby trap bombs everywhere. Left outside what was the library. Another two which the soldiers casually step over are positioned in the doorway of a medical station. And another left sitting outside a factory building used for storing weapons. We're taken to a large building which became known as the Rape House, where the IS fighters took women to abuse them. In one of the rooms, we find another booby trap bomb attached to the light switch. Uh, he says, uh, uh, he says uh, they have uh, some uh, intelligence. They tell him, uh, they, they give it some information. That Dash used this uh, hotel to uh, take a rest for fighters or to sleep with girls. To rape the girls. In the centre of the town is the market where hundreds of kidnapped women were traded. This, this was the area where they used to buy and sell the women. Um, the IS insignia has all been replaced by the Democratic Forces flag and the YPG flag. But this is where they used to buy and sell. This is the women's slave market, basically. We found a lone family still hiding out in the house. She told us how IS police used to punish women if any of their flesh was spotted. <coughs> they used electricity when any woman went outside, like to the market, she says. If they showed any bit of skin, they would shock you with these electric prods. <coughs> Al-Shaddadi is strategically and geographically important because it's the last major town before Raqqa and it's rich in gas and oil. IS financed its military operations by selling these natural resources. And in the manager's office we found documents showing one of the big customers was the Syrian regime. This, this is very important uh -huh. for one year. He says, the worker, Dakar al he is working here. He is working for Islamic State in, Syria, in Sham and Iraq. In the grounds of the oil installation, there was a large cache of bombs, all sizes, all shapes. There was a prime suicide vest and artillery shells from Latakia, a stronghold of the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad.
there are also rockets still in their casings. This will be used as proof that the Syrian leader is in league with the IS fighters and is funding and supplying them. The stash also had larger explosive devices, most likely to be used as roadside bombs and stacked up next to a pile of pressure plates. You join this plate to the fuse. They then bury the plate and then when there's any pressure on it, the bomb will explode. Also recovered are archaeological treasures. These are believed to be between six and 8,000 years old and thought to be a valuable source of funding for the IS group on the black market. Absolute horde of military equipment, including a whole stash of gas masks, lots and lots of them all over the place, as well as equipment to decontaminate your skin against a chemical attack. This is called Fuller's Earth, and you would typically put it on after a chemical attack. And there's also uh, a French version. We think this is what was used to decontaminate weapons in the event of a chemical attack. In amongst the IS fighters' homes, we found documents, photographs, and lists of kidnapped Yazidi women. They are coming from Sinjar Mountain and around Sinjar Mountain. These are the women that were taken name, from Sinjar and sold on as sex slaves. The name, the names of the girls, mother names, when they are from. At the, uh, the Their age, ages. Ages and mulahaza. Um, uh, not, uh, Some of them are very young, 18. Yes. yes. This, mm. such as this girl, it's by unto uh, Ayub al Jazrawi, Abu al Khair al Shami. They have this. That's who, who they're yes. sold to. Yes. So this could be a way of tracking down some of the women. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, can I show you this, these things which we picked up? We handed the evidence to the leader of a Kurdish group who are tracking down the kidnapped Yazidis and trying to rescue them. How useful will this list be for you? Yes, yes exactly. Uh, anything can help me. This 25-year-old mother of four was bought by an IS fighter called Omar. She was held as his sex slave for seven months. My days are difficult. I am escaped, but I still feel that I am under their hands. The fighter abused her children too and threatened to take them away if she didn't do what he wanted. She was given contraceptives so he could continue the abuse. From the first day when they captured us, we said that it's finished for us. And uh, uh, because they were not like humans, you can't imagine how they were. They were very violent, shouting every day on us, and uh, they were forcing us to do things, and we were, we were really forced to obey them. <laughs> They have others who are still in their hands. There's no peace even for the rescued. Too many atrocities witnessed, too many horrors endured. The troops are not in a mood to give up yet. They have reached the gates of Raqqa and their next target is in sight.